I would like to present Ross Young from the Madison County Agricultural Extension uh, Service. My name is Ross Young. I'm County Extension Director in Madison County, North Carolina. And it's my job to work with farmers and help them identify different crops and how to grow crops that can supplant the income and help their income in, in the counties that they live in. In Madison County, the number one income generated from agriculture traditionally has been barley tobacco. And for the past uh, 100 years or so, barley tobacco has been that income generating base that, that's brought close to $10 million of income into the county of Madison. Recently, there's been a number of changes in the barley tobacco industry that has decreased significantly that uh, contribution to the agricultural income in the county. And so we've got uh, in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood of 2,000 farmers who are now out of work uh, looking for other alternatives in which to grow on their farm and to stay profitable. So what happens is these farmers come into my office and ask me, Ross, what do I grow uh, to make money on my farm? And across the state of North Carolina, the answer to that is, is pretty varied. Uh, once you leave the mountain areas, you've got crops like soybeans, cotton, peanuts, um, wheat, corn, things of that nature that can be grown as an alternative to tobacco. In the mountains, however, that's, that's not, not the case. Uh, we have small fields, uh, and we can't grow some of these crops primarily based on income because, for example, an acre of wheat nets a farmer about $300. And if our typical farm has two acres of tillable land, um, that's $600. You're not going to pay me any bills with $600. So what we look at are farm enterprises that uh, will net a farmer $2,000 per acre so that they can actually have some sort of income in which to, uh, to pay their bills with. Now, when a farmer comes into my office, uh, there's two, two crops that I cannot tell him or her to grow. And one of those is marijuana. Uh, obviously, you can't grow it because the law enforcement's going to catch you and confiscate that, so that crops out. And the second one, believe it or not, is ginseng. Now, I can tell them to grow ginseng, but I can't recommend it with any confidence that they're going to actually see that crop to market. And the primary reason is because it is going to get stolen. Uh, it, it's a fact. It happens all across the mountains of western North Carolina and particularly in Madison County. Um, in my office, I, I do still recommend some growing of ginseng. I do it with caution. Uh, when I'm on a farm, though, talking to a farmer, let's say a two-hour farm visit, I'm going to spend maybe 20 or 30 minutes telling the farmer how to grow the crop. The other hour and a half plus is going to be talking about security, cameras, chain link fencing, dogs, uh, access, public access, how close is your house to the, to the planting so that you can watch and, and try to make sure that your crop doesn't get stolen. Um, so it's really discouraging. It would be nice to be able to offer that as an enterprise to people. My office does research on ginseng, on how to plant it and grow it. Uh, and we also sell ginseng seed occasionally. I have sold as much as 50 pounds one year of seed to farmers in the area, but, but very little of that honestly actually makes it back with dollars into the farmer's pockets, unfortunately. Uh, ginseng is not without problems. There are some problems with growing the plant. It's not the, the solution to all the farming issues across western North Carolina by any means. There's diseases and there's uh, production limitations, there's rodents, uh, germination problems, and, and everybody in the world couldn't grow ginseng or it would eventually flood the market, but there is a real good market. But the biggest problem with ginseng is theft. And by the way, theft of ginseng is a felony. And a lot of people don't realize that it is a felony to be on someone else's property and to dig ginseng. The way around that is to get written permission within 180 days of the time you're digging uh, and be carried by the digger when they're on the property digging the ginseng, and then you're perfectly legal. Other than that, being caught on someone else's property is a felony for digging it. So let's just pretend for a minute that ginseng uh, theft didn't happen, that farmers could use ginseng as an alternative crop and, and could count on that income at the end of so many years to, to add to, to their farm income. A typical farm in the mountains got 60 acres of land, um, 40 acres of it's in woods. Now, ginseng doesn't grow in all, all wooded areas, but it grows well in a lot of wooded areas. So let's just be conservative and say that half of that 40-acre woodlot uh, is suitable for growing ginseng. So that's 20 acres of ginseng. So doing the math on that, growing ginseng is a lot like growing Christmas trees, and I work a lot with Christmas tree growers as well. Uh, it's a long-term crop. 
And when we look at financial budgets on it, we have to look at taking an acre of a crop, growing it for the number of years it needs to be grown. In, in ginseng's case, anywhere from five to 10 is the range, and, and my numbers are based on eight years. So you plant a crop, and at the end of eight years, you, you look at the income generated, then you divide that number by eight years to get an annual income base so you can then compare it to other crops. Where earlier I mentioned wheat brings $300 on an acre. Uh, ginseng can bring as much as $7,000 an acre per year to a farmer. Now that's, that's a good bit of income. And you do the math out, and, and you look at, at if a farmer had that 40-acre woodlot, half of it was suitable for ginseng. They planted that 20 acres in ginseng, and you were making $7,000 per year equivalent uh, on that 20 acres, that's $140,000 a year for growing ginseng. That is an awesome alternative enterprise for a farmer to, to be able to look at. Um, of course, everybody can't grow it. It's not something that 10,000 people could probably grow. Eventually, the market would get full and, and we'd have problems. But the market is very strong, and a lot of people could grow ginseng and could mix it into their farming practices and, and really make a big difference. Um, let's say, for example, a hundred farmers grew 20 acres and added that to their income. You're looking at uh, millions of dollars, 14 million to be exact, in, in the scenario that I shared of income into Western North Carolina uh, because of using ginseng. You know, right now, people go and dig ginseng, and in Madison County, somewhere around 800 pounds is being dug every year, uh, primarily wild ginseng because it does grow wild in the mountains and then that's sold for anywhere from three to four hundred dollars a pound. Uh, pretty good income for some people that's going and digging. The, the downside to that, unfortunately, based on the conversations I've had with people and, and seen knowledge, first-hand knowledge of some of this happening is my guess is that half of that 800 pounds is actually taken from someone else's property. And that's unfortunate. You know, that is theft, it is a felony, and, and that much is being taken. So it's, it's scary, and it's, it's unfortunate that we can't promote this as a, as a crop as much as we would like to. Um, I could hear arguments. I, I could understand someone arguing to me and saying, Ross, uh, if the crop is that lucrative, then people would be able to afford all the security measures they would need, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an issue. Well, you've got a point. But on the other hand, where I gave the example of a farmer planting 20 acres, I did that to make the scenario work out, but in reality, the average farm is probably looking at one to two acres of planting of ginseng. And when you're looking at that, it's still significant income, but your ratio between the income generated and the number of dollars that is going to be able to need to be spent on security, that ratio shifts, and then that makes it not as profitable. So you look at someone who, who doesn't have $140,000 a year to play with, they've got a smaller number, maybe $7,000, $10,000 to play with. Then fencing, chain link fencing, security cameras, uh, dogs, all that stuff comes into play in a big way in terms of eating away at the profits for the farmers. Of all of the uh, ginseng that was harvested last um, reporting cycle, which I have is 1999, Madison was third, coming uh, only behind Jackson and Buncombe County. Uh, the reason that we have such a potential for ginseng here is our climate and our mountains and our terrain. Our terrain is ideal for growing ginseng. Now, the problem with it is that in the past, most of the farmers have been able to live off of the tobacco money they've been given. We all know tobacco is not a viable crop in the future, and it's not sustainable. Ginseng, on the other hand, is sustainable and is a viable crop. Ross Young was uh, talking about a farmer who had some beef cattle and um, uh, could uh, use his uh, farm lot, uh, woodland lots for uh, growing uh, ginseng, would be able to, if I believe uh, his figure was $200,000, uh, uh, could, could, could make a living uh, with uh, the cattle and the ginseng and uh, another couple of crops and, and be in that range and have a viable farm. This is one of the major areas that will uh, allow Madison County to 
uh, have small farms and also to um, uh, be a viable, sustainable uh, agricultural community in the future. If ginseng is not protected, um, then the, the tendency is for people to walk on the land and people will not want to uh, start growing this because it is a long-term crop. Is ginseng first year. We're going to show you some slides later on. But it's a small, insignificant plant until it gets big. It takes seven to ten years to become medicinally active. So it's not a short uh, uh, time uh, growing the crop like you would have with tobacco. You put it in, you harvest that year. We're talking about a long-term en endeavor. And if uh, the crop is not protected, it's going to be stolen. One of the things that I saw on a video uh, a long time ago was how a ginseng digger would uh, operate. And they usually have a locust post with a point on it as a walking stick. When they come across a ginseng plant, they'll look at the plant, they'll determine which way the plant's growing in the ground, they'll take that stick and they'll shove it into the ground. They'll yank the ground and make the ground looser and then they'll just take that uh, ginseng plant from the root uh, on the top and they'll pull it up. They'll throw it into the gunny sack and they keep on moving. Uh, the, the reality is that they're going to have to harvest at least four or five hundred plants to make it worth their while to be out there for a couple of days. Um, the market for growing uh, or for purchasing wild organic ginseng that is stolen from lands is up to 500 bucks a pound. That's pretty good living, $500 a pound. But it takes a lot of plants to do that. Four or 500 plants growing in one area is not a problem. Having somebody come in and take those 500 plants, they could do that in about 20 minutes and be out of there. So unless there's some real enforcement of this, we're going to have a problem in getting this to become a, a product, uh, an agricultural product that um, can sustain Madison County in the future.